Want to know the cause of erectile dysfunction so you can prevent and even reverse it? Well, you've come to the right place. I first learned of Dr. Aaron Spitz from the wildly popular scene in the Game Changers film where he conducted an erection experiment on three collegiate athletes. I'm sure you've seen it too. Dr. Spitz directs the Center for Male Reproductive Medicine and Surgery at Orange County Urology in California. I have more on Dr. Spitz's very impressive background in the description below. In his book, aptly named The Penis Book, Dr. Spitz describes that the most common reason for erectile dysfunction has to do with a problem of blood flow to the penis due to narrowing of the arteries. In my conversation with Dr. Spitz, we talk about the causes as well as what you can do to prevent and possibly even reverse erectile dysfunction. All right, Dr. Spitz, thank you so much for your time today. Yeah, my pleasure. You and others have stated that erectile dysfunction is an early indicator of a possible heart attack or stroke. Um, physiologically, what's happening? Why, why is that the case? So the same process that is affecting the blood vessels of the heart and causing heart disease or the blood vessels of the neck that can lead to stroke is happening in all the blood vessels throughout the body. And the penis is an organ that's primarily made of blood vessels and it sticks outside of us and it gives us an indication of how healthy or unhealthy those blood vessels are by its ability to have an erection or not have an erection. So it's this little window into the health of our blood vessels. We can't really peer into our heart and see how healthy those blood vessels are. We might be able to feel our heart beat if we put our hand on our chest or listen with a stethoscope, but we can't really get a good sense of the function of our heart the way we can with our penis. Likewise, it's hard to know how clogged or unclogged those arteries in our neck are leading to our brain. If we get an ultrasound every now and then, we can spot check it, but the penis lets us know every night, every day, how good those blood vessels are functioning. And as the blood vessels in our body deteriorate and we head towards heart attacks or strokes, that same process is deteriorating our ability to get erections, but even sooner, even sooner than the heart attack or stroke because the blood vessels to the penis start out much smaller. And so it takes less to shut them off or to bring them to that tipping point where they don't function properly. Less disease, less time to affect the penis than to affect the heart or the brain. So in a sense, it gives you a warning signal. It gives you a little bit of a lead time, but you got to pay attention to it. If you just blow it off and you're not getting regular checkups or some other evaluation of the health of your blood vessels, you could then have a heart attack or a stroke sometime later. Maybe it's a few years later, maybe it's a few months later, but it's important to take heed and pay attention and then check on those bigger, more vital organs. So how do specific chronic diseases affect um, blood flow to the penis. And the, the one I wanted, was hoping you'd talk about a little bit is obesity um, and, and possibly even diabetes. Like what are some of the reasons why um, those chronic diseases can contribute to erectile dysfunction? So the health of blood flow in our arteries and in our veins is linked to the health of the, the molecules and the, the receptors on the cells. In a condition like diabetes, there is a imbalance, uh, an overload of sugar molecules in our blood, and this wreaks havoc on the cells of pretty much all the tissues of our body. But in particular, it really destroys the smaller blood vessels throughout our body. And that includes all the small blood vessels that comprise the penis that fill up the chambers of the penis. And so those blood vessels are deteriorating in that setting of, a, of the abnormal amounts of glucose and the sugar, uh, sugar in the blood. And it's causing the cells of those small blood vessels to get fibrotic, to get hard, and not be able to expand and fill with blood. 
it's what you see when blood vessels age. So it's effectively causing a premature aging and a premature destruction of all those cells that make those small blood vessels. It's also doing that to the nerves. And an erection requires not just blood flow, but nerve signals as well. And so both of those are being hit by diabetes. Now diabetes is also taking its toll on the small blood vessels of the eyes. <clears throat> and it causes uh, diabetic uh, blindness. Uh, it causes problems with the feet, uh, the small blood vessels in the feet and the toes. And it can cause um, actual death to those tissues and gangrene and the need for amputations. And so the destruction of the small blood vessels throughout the body is also reflected in problems with the penis and with erections. Obesity and diabetes often go hand in hand. People who are obese have a much higher risk of then developing diabetes. And people with diabetes, type two diabetes, uh, can have trouble keeping their weight down and can also develop obesity. So they really can go hand in hand. And the excess fat that people carry when they are obese generates toxic molecules that go into the bloodstream. We call these free radicals or oxidants. And they also deteriorate the lining of the small blood vessels and the large blood vessels and cause fibrosis over time as well. So an obese person, whether or not they have diabetes, is causing strain on their other body tissues from these free radicals that their fat cells are dumping into their bloodstream, but they're also at high risk of developing diabetes, which then has very obvious devastating consequences on the body tissues. Yeah, okay. And you talk about uh, the endothelium. Can you define what the endothelium is and elaborate on the role of antioxidants, specifically nitric oxide, on endothelial function? So endothelium is the name of a lining of cells that line all of the blood vessels in our body, big and small. It's a single layer of cells that have a very important role in regulating how the blood vessels expand or contract to allow more or less blood into a different part of the body. Now they don't do the expanding or the contracting. Right behind that layer, between the blood uh, and behind them. They sit between the blood and a layer behind them and that layer is a smooth muscle layer. That's the layer that actually contracts or relaxes, but it's the endothelium that will release signals to that muscle layer to trigger it, to relax and open up or to allow it to remain contracted. And that signal that the endothelium releases to that smooth muscle layer to cause it to relax and open up and increase blood flow is nitric oxide. Mm -hmm. So the endothelial layer produces nitric oxide and releases it onto the smooth muscle. But we also can take in nitric oxide from the foods we eat, uh, from various nutrients, and the greatest source of nitric oxide that we can take in deliberately in our diet is from plants, from vegetables and fruits. And the ratio of nitric oxide that we can get from plant-based foods is far higher than what we can find in animal-based foods. As we get older, our endothelial layer will produce less nitric oxide of its own. And therefore the importance of supplementing nitric oxide with our diet increases. When I say older, I'm just talking about in our 30s. That decline starts in our 30s. So deliberately consuming plant-based foods that are higher in nitric oxide helps us to continue to maximize the health of our blood vessels and increase the blood flow, allow those blood vessels to relax. There's another thing that nitric oxide also does to the cells of our blood vessels, which is quite remarkable. And that is, it has an anti-aging effect. So not only does it allow the blood vessels to expand and allow more blood flow to our different body parts, but the nitric oxide goes into the mitochondria of each cell and has an anti-aging effect at that level, decreasing the rate at which those cells age and become fibrotic. So nitric oxide 
prevents the cells from deteriorating as quickly. And so do other antioxidants that protect the cell from free radicals, from toxic chemicals. But nitric oxide is a particularly important and complex molecule that has both of those functions. So it sounds like a whole food plant-based diet is um, probably maybe the most penis-friendly dietary pattern that, that a man could adopt. Would you say that's the case? Yes, I would say it uh, gives you a plant-powered penis. <laughs> nice. <laughs> All right. So um, in your book, you talk about phosphates, which I really appreciate because as a nutritionist, I don't think, you know, we talk enough about some of the micronutrients such as phosphate. And, um, you know, the American diet is loaded with phosphates and phosphate additives, in particular found in colas, um, ultra-processed convenience foods, um, uh, energy drinks, and that sort of thing. Can you talk a little more about how excessive phosphate consumption contributes to erectile dysfunction? Yeah, so phosphates are very destructive to blood vessels because they cause calcium deposition within the blood vessels. They cause the muscle layer of the blood vessels to calcify, to harden. You've heard of hardening of the arteries. Well, that's exactly what calcification of the arteries means. And phosphates causes that to happen very quickly, much faster than just typical aging would, much faster than even things like a high cholesterol, high fat, atherosclerotic inducing diet would. These phosphates are very insidious because they, as you pointed out, are in so many food products and they're added. They're an artificially added ingredient that sometimes is used to substitute for salt so that you can have a low salt alternative item that's quote unquote healthier for you because it's got lower sodium, but it's not because it's got phosphate. But even more commonly, it's added as a whitener. So it allows say, uh, non-dairy milk beverages to appear more white. Some soy milks have phosphate in them, for example, or it allows flour uh, to look more white. So a lot of uh, pancake and waffle mixes, for example, have it in it. And then you'll find it in cereals and you'll find it in the, in the most unlikely of places. Uh, and certainly it's in uh, colas like um, Coca-Cola, for example. And this is a, an impact on the blood vessels that is not very well known. I was fortunate enough to learn about it from one of the leading scientists in this field of research at a private conference in a live lecture. But you really won't hear about it very much in mainstream medical news. But if you start to do a literature search, you'll find that it is published. And people that are uh, more prone to the damage of their blood vessels from phosphates are those with renal failure mm -hmm. uh, who require dialysis because their body is not able to eliminate the phosphate as well. And so the effect is accelerated. But when studies have been done looking at dietary intake of phosphate, just dietary intake alone can have measurable effects uh, over a relatively short period of time. So it really is this sort of um, this, this secret enemy uh, that is really kind of everywhere. And the way to protect yourself from it it's just simply read the ingredient list. Yeah, and, and also, you know, just eat as much whole plant food because, you know, you're, you're not, there won't be any additives in those uh, types of products. Yeah, if it doesn't have a wrapper or a box or a can, there's not going to be an ingredient list on it. So that's right. <laughs> awesome. Okay, before we move into physical activity, I wanted to um, you to talk a little more about excess alcohol consumption and tobacco use and the role those two play in contributing to ED. So excess alcohol consumption is a bit of a paradox because a lot of people think of alcohol as a bit of a social lubricant or an aphrodisiac. And in fact, at modest levels, it certainly can uh, act that way. But when consumed excessively, it has negative physical effects on the body, on sexual function. Alcohol at more than just mild to moderate levels is a toxin to the cells in your body. And 
When consumed excessively, it also suppresses brain centers. We all know that uh, if we've ever had a little too much to drink. And it can uh, suppress the brain centers that are important in the sexual response and can then blunt your ability to have a erection, even though you're being stimulated, even though you're in a sexual environment, it can make it more difficult if you've had excessive alcohol. As we get older, we tend to be more sensitive to the effects of alcohol. Uh, as young people, we may consume alcohol excessively and not really pay a price for it at that time in our lives. And then find that later, as we get older, that same amount of alcohol or even less takes a much greater toll, not just in how we feel, say, the next morning, but in how we perform that night. Really excessive consumption of alcohol can lead to cirrhosis. Cirrhosis is a disease of the liver because the liver has to process that alcohol, that toxin to protect you from it. And it puts it under strain and eventually diseases it. And men with cirrhosis have abnormally low levels of testosterone and abnormally high levels of estrogen. And testosterone and estrogen balance is important for sexual function as well. Cigarette smoking causes hardening of the arteries. Need I say more? Right. Bad arteries, bad erections, not to mention the other effects it has on your lungs and, uh, and the risk of uh, stroke and heart attack, et cetera. But uh, cigarette smoking does decrease blood flow to the penis uh, due to its effects on those smaller blood vessels of the penis. All right, let's move on to physical activity. So in your book, you state that being sedentary increases your risk of becoming impotent by about 10 times. How does physical inactivity contribute to erectile dysfunction? What are kind of the mechanisms that contribute to this? Well, physical activity helps erectile dysfunction because exercise actually causes the lining of our blood vessels to release antioxidants. So as I mentioned, antioxidants like nitric oxide are going to help protect the blood vessels from aging prematurely, as well as allow them to expand and fill with blood more. And the actual increased shearing effect of those blood cells blowing by the walls of the blood vessel because your heart is pumping so much harder when you're exercising, triggers the release of these beneficial chemicals into that same circulatory system. It's a mechanical molecular effect. Furthermore, keeping those blood vessels open and keeping the blood flow uh, well distributed throughout your body, including your penis, brings oxygen to the cells and carries waste away. And so the better circulation you have, the better your sexual function and the functioning of your penis will be and exercise increases the blood flow, the oxygenation, the clearing of toxins. So not only does it cause the release of good antioxidants directly into your blood, it's carrying that blood where it needs to go to bring the nutrients and to return uh, the waste products. Also, there are effects on your brain, uh, endorphin release, and, uh, and other kinds of downstream effects that can help you sleep better at night, for example. And if you get a good night's sleep, you will release more testosterone and you will release less adrenaline and you'll have better erections as a result of higher testosterone and lower adrenaline from a good night's sleep. These are indirect benefits of exercise in addition to the direct benefits of exercise. Now a person can exercise too much or in an incorrect way and actually hurt their sexual function. So for example, uh, if a person is in extreme physical duress, uh, say boot camp. Boot camp is a lot of exercise, but it is so stressful that it actually can lower one's testosterone. Or if somebody is in a very extreme physical situation, combat, for example, lowers the testosterone. Elite athletes are, who are endurance athletes are noted to have lower average testosterones, but it is not causing them harm. They're still in a good balance. They are still fertile. They are still sexually active. It just shows you though that our bodies do adjust to extremes. And so my recommendation is routine, regular exercise. And even if you're an elite endurance athlete, fine, but you can overdo things. Uh, the kind of exercise you do 
as long as it's getting your heart pumping and, uh, and, and you're feeling vigorous, it's fine. But for a small percentage of guys, bicycle seats can be a problem. For the majority of guys, it's not. But a small percentage of guys, their pelvises are built, are configured in such a way that that bicycle seat kind of goes in there like a key and lock and it squeezes on the nerves and the blood vessels that go to their penis and it can cause numbness in the penis and it can even cause damage to the blood vessels and reduce the flow of blood to the penis. Now, usually this is a temporary effect and if a guy is noticing this and he gets off the bike and switches to a different form of exercise or is able to find a different kind of seat that really avoids that pressure, then it typically goes away. But this is something that is noted in a higher percentage in professional cyclists and in occupations that require cycling, such as bicycle police, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm, I'm a cyclist and I have a lot of cycling friends. And so um, for the guys out watching this, um, don't ignore, I guess, the symptoms is, is yeah. what you're suggesting. And, and yeah. if you feel numbness after you get off the bike, maybe switch out the seat or, um, you know, talk to your doctor about, you know, what, what you might be able to do about it. Yeah, pay attention to your symptoms. Don't blow it off because, you know, we tend to get into a mentality, especially for athletes of, you know, hey, walk it off, rub it out. Um, but, you know, some of those symptoms you don't want to walk off or rub out, you want to pay attention to. Yeah. So what would you say would be ideal exercise for just the average person? Is there a number of minutes a day or times per week would be ideal just for, you know, just you know, it really, it, it really can vary depending on, you know, what you read and who you talk to. I don't claim to be a um, exercise physiologist or, or a fitness guru, uh, but it seems to me from what I've read and seen that ideally, if you can exercise most days of the week, and ideally, if you can get in at least uh, 20 to 30 minutes of sustained vigorous exercise, um, that is a good minimum, you know, build from there. But that would be what I would recommend as a minimum. Okay, great. Um, so let's talk about let's talk about sleep. Um, you mentioned a little bit about testosterone. Can you um, talk a little deeper about how sleep can contribute to uh, penis health? Yes. So there's two ways that sleep affects penis health. One is it promotes the release of testosterone, which is good for the penis. If you don't get enough sleep, you may be releasing too much adrenaline, which is not so good for erections. So let's talk about testosterone and the promotion of that. The pituitary gland is a little pea-sized part of your brain that sits right behind your eyeballs, and it releases hormones that stimulate the testicles to release the testosterone. And the pituitary gland releases those hormones more when we are asleep so that in the morning our testosterone levels are higher from that nighttime release of the stimulation to the testicles to make it but it only happens when we're in REM sleep when we're in that deep dreaming sleep and so if we have a poor night's sleep and don't get as much REM sleep we're not going to have produced as much of those signals from the pituitary gland to the testicle and our testicles will not have made as much testosterone. And it has been noted that in people who are unable to get a good night's sleep, say because they're night shift workers, for example, their testosterone levels are actually lower. Or in people who can't get a good night's sleep because of sleep apnea, a condition where their airway kind of closes off and they snore excessively, but they're actually suffocating periodically through the night, even though they may not consciously know it. But because even though they're not waking up, their bodies aren't able to fall all the way into REM sleep from that stress of the sleep apnea, they are producing less testosterone as well. And these men can notice decrease in their sexual function as a result of that, not just decrease in desire, but also decrease in the function of their penis. Now let's talk about adrenaline. In the case of sleep apnea, which is very common and very underdiagnosed, the stress of not getting enough oxygen triggers the body at a subconscious level, even though you don't wake up and feel ah, stress, I can't breathe, even though you might sleep through it, your body knows, and it releases adrenaline. Adrenaline is the hormone that our body uses to help us counteract stress, to help us survive an attack or an injury. 
And so the way adrenaline works is it shunts all the blood to the most vital organs, the heart, the lungs, the liver, the brain, away from less vital structures like our fingers, our toes, and our penis. And if we are suffering from sleep apnea, we have a higher level of adrenaline release in our body, and that kind of has an effect that can persist even after we wake up. And that adrenaline is constricting the blood vessels for our penis, making it harder for us to get or maintain an erection, even in some cases making our penis appear like it's shrinking because it's contracting. Because the size of our penis is related to how full or empty from blood it is, how contracted or how relaxed those blood vessels are. Okay. So bottom line, it sounds like eat a whole food plant-based diet. For sure. Um, exercise consistently. Yes. Limit alcohol, avoid tobacco. Yes. And, and get a good night's sleep. Indeed. You've hit on four <laughs> of the five points of my five-point plan for maximum <laughs> penis health. Awesome. So what's good for the body is also good for the penis. Yes, there's one more point that mm -hmm. I'll bring up, and that is pornography. Mm. Pornography is ubiquitous, and it has a very negative and harmful effect on male sexual function if observed too frequently. Uh, men who observe pornography daily, sometimes a few times a day, have been shown to have a significant decline in their ability to initiate or keep erections, or even to reach sexual climax, not to mention the potential psychological difficulties of relationships. But it turns out that very frequent pornographic viewing actually shrinks centers in the brain that are important for sexual responsiveness, makes them physically smaller over time. Fortunately, it is a reversible effect, but it can take several months to undo. And the regimen is to just stop viewing it. Because pornography is so available and so ubiquitous, I think it's important to point that out because a lot of people don't realize that and they can be doing everything else right, but not realizing that what they're looking at is having a physical and physiological effect on their body as well. All right. Well, thank you for that. Um, and your book, The Penis Book, is very comprehensive. I love all the puns. I mean, yeah. there's, there's <laughs> so many puns. I love it. <laughs> so... <laughs> it's just inherently fun <laughs> yeah <laughs> fun to talk about so thank you so much for your time i really appreciate you great thanks a lot Analyze.